NetSparker, the developers of desktop and cloud-based web application security scanners that enable you to automatically identify vulnerabilities in your web applications and web services. NetSparker scanners employ a unique and dead-accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities with their proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at netsparker.com or email at contact at netsparker.com. Signal Sciences secures the most important web applications, APIs, and microservices of the world's leading companies, protecting over 7,500 applications and 150 billion production requests per week, Signal Science's next-gen WAF and RASP help companies increase security and maintain site reliability without sacrificing velocity, all at the lowest total cost of ownership. Signal Science's patented technology protects any application against any attack with integrations into any DevOps tool chain. Signal Science's, demand more from your WAF. Learn more at signalsciences.com forward slash PSW. Welcome back to Paul's Security Weekly. Sign up for Pandora Podcasting. That's right, early access to Pandora Podcasting. You can go to, and I, I, I say this URL, I'm skeptical. It looks like a phishing attack. I saw it's, I, I'm just throwing that out there. Like, I know it looks like a phishing attack. However, we're really excited. That aside, we're really excited uh, to have some of our shows included in the beta for Pandora Podcast, which uh, represents 70 million uh, potential new users to, uh, to podcasts. So uh, it is pandorapodcast.beta.splashthat.com, which is... You, you said dot, but there's no dot in the... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're somewhere. right, Jeff. It is pandorapodcastbeta.splashthat.com. Click the link. Yeah, just click, just, click, just click. Anyway, or just click wait it, till click it, it, click it, click it, click wait it, till it, it comes. Anyway, we're excited. You're not being that. fished. Just click it, click it now. That's it. <laughs> John, John <laughs> Moore is here with us. He's the senior product manager for DF Labs. John, welcome back to the show. Hey, what's going on, guys? Glad to be here again. Nice to have you. Uh, I was just telling uh, John that uh, Dario Forte, your uh, founder and CEO, was on Business Security Weekly. Great conversation. Uh, that we had uh, with him um, really, you know, kind of opened our eyes to the SOAR market. And I didn't realize how, deep, you know, like deep the rabbit hole went and how far back in time, like you, you guys were doing this really before it was like the cool thing to do and Gartner was talking about it in that, in that whole thing. So um, John's here tonight to talk about um, automation and response uh, as it relates to instant response. So John, thanks for being here. Yeah, no, again, thanks for having me. Yeah, Dario, Dario's a great guy, very smart guy. He's one of those guys that uh, just seems he has a story for everything. He, he's he's done everything. Uh, you just wonder, uh, you know, how he managed to pack all that into uh, into his career. But uh, incredibly, incredibly smart guy, great guy to work for. Uh, so yeah, so uh, I just wanted to come in and, and, and chat for a few minutes about um, automation and orchestration and how it can really help enable uh, not just the, the technical components of incident response, but uh, kind of the, the whole incident response process. I think, you know, my background prior to product management is, is in incident response. I, I did it in law enforcement and I did it uh, as, a, as a consultant in the private sector as well. And, you know, one of the things that, that I noticed was that a lot of times the, the failures that we saw in incident response weren't necessarily technical failures. It wasn't that we didn't have the right technology. It wasn't that we didn't have really smart people doing the incident response that could handle the technical aspects. It was it was often failures of, of other components, right? We get so focused on the, the technical portion of the incident response that we don't focus on some of the other stuff. What do you mean by other stuff? Thank you. That was my question too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. See, see your teleprompter better than you can, Paul. That wasn't on my teleprompter. I, is there is there other music going on, or is that just on my end? It's just on your end. Just in your head, John. Apparently. <laughs> really? Because I can hear the net sparker ad again. Oh, interesting. Are you playing the broadcast somewhere on another web page? Because there might be a delay. Oh, maybe. Are you playing the hey. the podcast on there another we go. Uh, webpage? I got quiet again. Okay. I don't know. I was getting feedback. Echo, anyway. echo, echo. Apologize for that. Yeah, right. Are you playing the webcast <laughs> on another 
page. I haven't even had any whiskey up. tonight either, which is which is odd. Wow. Um, so in any case, yeah. So no, we, we get focused on the other. We we don't focus on the other stuff. Is is what I was getting at. And uh, so you know, it's it's things like the the processes and the and the people. And, and the management of the incident that, uh, you know, we often fall down on, right? And I think we see sort of the same, um, uh, the same problems when, we, when some people look at SOAR. When we think about SOAR technology and we think about automation and, and orchestration, we think about the, the technical components, right? We think about, you know, how can we automate different technologies? And, and that's all great stuff to do. Um, but... I think one thing that we don't really uh, focus on a lot when we evaluate SOAR technologies and when we look at the potential benefits of a SOAR technology is how it can um, really help kind of streamline your other processes, how you can orchestrate your people, how you can orchestrate your processes through that. So I got to be honest, when I worked, I, it's been a long time since I worked in incident response. I got out of it because I hated being on call. Mm. Um, but when, when I worked in incident response, there was always like an owner of the incident. There was like a human person that owned the incident and everything that happened, they, they would be like a shift worker that would uh, hand over to the next, per, next, next shift and things like that. Um, how can SOAR replicate that sort of uh, uh, oversight and um, being able to have, s uh, like, how does it replicate that, I guess, is my question. Yeah, well, you need something that can handle all those tasks as well. I, one of the things that we've noticed a lot, I think, over the past year is uh, a, a lot of other people, a lot of other companies coming in and adding automation and orchestration to their products. You know, it's it's kind of a it's a thing now, right? Automation, orchestration, everybody wants to be in it, and and I'm not knocking that. I, I think that's fantastic. There there's some. It's not just a buzzword. I think automation and orchestration can provide real benefits to a lot of different areas of, of security operations. Um, but I think there's a, a fundamental difference between um, you know a, a, an existing product that has implemented some level of automation or some level of orchestration of different products. And an actual source solution, right? Something that's a full-fledged source solution. And I think that a full-fledged full -fledged source solution should include things like the ability to provide those incident management functions, to provide, um, you know, managing of tasks, to provide asset management, those sort of things that that, that incident manager is going to be concerned with, right? The the, the tracking, the auditing. Um, those, those are critical components, and I think that's a lot of what we overlook in a, in a SOAR technology. Um, you know, we think about, hey, how can we, uh, you know, automate searching our scene? How can we automate getting threat intelligence? How can we automate containment? And, and don't get me wrong, those are all fantastic, but, you know, you can do those, you know, with, with a, you know, with a little bit here and a little bit there. Uh, John, know, if, I, if, if I can interrupt, because I, I like everyone's question a lot, and I think that when you need an incident manager, it's because largely communication has broken down uh, or just isn't in place. Or to maintain it. Or to maintain it, right? And your technology isn't in place because you've got data from your incident and, and all these things all over the place. And I think where I like to see us moving is that we're better at communicating as a whole, that we've done tabletop exercises, that we've mapped out our, our incident uh, handling process and incident response processes. Also, where, in a, where I think John comes in is the technology is now really truly supporting us so that we don't really have to work as hard as an incident, incident manager if you've got good communication and good technology that's helping you bring things together. And you understand the process that has to happen. Has to, and to everyone has to agree how, on that process right, too. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's a hard one. That's hard. That's no, this, hard. The software should be really an enabler to the process, I think, yep. is, is yeah. the critical thing. It, it shouldn't just be about automating your technology. It should be about enabling the processes to happen. It should be about enabling the people, whether it's through communication, 
documentation of the of the processes that are supposed to be happening, tracking those processes, making sure that incident manager and that everybody involved is working off the same set of information. That's another yeah. thing that's, that's, that's so key. critical that we see fall down all the time is that information sharing where you've got people across, you know, different stakeholders, different groups, even different geographies, um, you know, having that central repository of information is, is another critical component. Jeff? Jeff, I think you're muted. Thank you for pointing out that you couldn't hear me. Uh, what? I perked up when you <laughs> what? when you said uh, it's not really a buzzword, it's, it's really a thing. Um, for the benefit of the audience and for people that may not you know, work in this field, be familiar, could you, uh, I'm, I'm calling you on it's not a buzzword, could you actually explain you know, just very quickly what it is we're talking about in terms of SOAR? And not, you know, not just what the, it stands for, but what, what do the different components mean that make up this, this term? Please. So uh, SOAR itself stands for Security Orchestration Automation and Response. Um, now, depending on you know who's defining exactly what each of those components mean, uh, you know it, it, you end up with a little bit different definition. But we, we tend to look at, at basically three three core components of what a SOAR solution should be. It's it's automation, right? The A in, in, in SOAR, and that's really. Um, automating processes, automating technologies. So being able to go out and automatically query, enrich information, gather intelligence, being able to automate containment. So going out, blocking an IP address, isolating a host, banning a hash value, things like that. The, mm -hmm. the second core component is the, the orchestration. And, and part of the, 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 what I was trying to get at tonight was that orchestration definitely involves orchestrating different technologies for sure. That's a huge component of SOAR. And, and not just security, out, John, right? Like when we talk about it is security orchestration and automation, but the orchestration is not just security tools, right? No, absolutely. And that's, that's what I, you know, kind of getting at is that orchestration is, is also about orchestrating the people that are involved, orchestrating different stakeholders, different groups, orchestrating the different processes that are involved the notification the technical processes the legal processes so orchestration is the, is the second big component that's really kind of bringing those individual silos together whether they're technology silos you know process people silos and then the the, the third major component of SOAR I think that really is is critical is is the, the ability to respond and measure so you know being able to actually get good metrics, being able to, to record actionable metrics, actionable intelligence, and, and being able to uh, use that to inform and, and improve not just your response to that one security incident, but also the, you know, your, your overall security program. So I think automation, orchestration, and measurement, I think, are kind of the three major components of SOAR that, that really make it the solution that it needs to be. What are some of the metrics that you would track to ensure that you we're able to improve over time because that's something that is really interesting to me like how do what do you think is the most important thing to be able to um to acknowledge as a key um in indicator of success during or failure during an incident boy we could probably have a whole segment on just uh what metrics are important to to measure i think for me and and i i know it sounds like kind of a, a get out of jail answer i think it really depends I, I i think the metrics are very dependent on what's important to your organization a metric for uh you know an mssp is obviously going to be very different than than a SOC and um, you know, depending on on what your what your critical processes are, I think that's you know that's what you've got to look at. What's what's critical to the organization? Where are you falling down? And and how can we actually record you know actionable metrics, not just hey let's let's record numbers for the sake of recording numbers, but let's let's record metrics that we can actually then take action and can form a security program. And I think you you gather those five or six critical metrics that that are important to your organization. And, and it's not necessarily a, a good or bad. I, I think the most important thing is being able to show improvement, being able to take those, make them actionable, and being able to show that, you know, your 
whatever you're whatever change you're implementing is is able to positively impact those metrics is I that primarily that's based on human response or is that based on um maybe failure of the ability to obtain some like a piece of information via automation or or what are some of the, like i mean do you have any examples of, of maybe some some common things that could be improved well, I think you know a, a lot of the metrics that, that we tend to focus on uh, in in SOAR is is the amount of time that people spend doing manual tasks, right? SOAR is all about automation. It's about being a force multiplier for your security team. So, a, a lot of the metrics that that we focus on as a SOAR vendor are, um, you know, how much time is it taking your security staff to do these manual, these kind of repeatable tasks, things like enriching information, going in. Uh, correlating data manually, and and then you know how much time can we save you as a, as a store solution? So I don't I don't know if that's necessarily going to be the most important metric to every organization, but certainly when you're evaluating a store solution and, and the effectiveness of a store solution, being able to identify those manual tasks and and how much time your analysts are spending on a on a daily, weekly, monthly basis performing those tasks and then being able to measure the amount of time that the, the automating those tasks through a sort of solution is saving you. I think that's a huge metric. Yeah, time I agree. Different measurements of time through the process is important. Jeff, question. Well I'm I'm curious. Earlier you said something about uh you know, there being disparate groups and silos and there's a need for communication and getting people all banded together and 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 when you were describing you know what's important in terms of sort of agreeing as, as an organization you know, your it depends response of what's important to the organization is what's important to emphasize what's important to measure is uh, you know tie the two together in, when you're setting up or, or going down the road of we want to do some sort of soar activity soar solution um you know, I can imagine if you have a siloed organization. I, I'm I'm dealing this with this with a customer right now. In fact, uh, if you have, let's say, for example, six different silos, just arbitrarily, you might have six different notions of what's important and what there is to measure, and none of those might be what's important uh, to the company as a whole. Uh, how how do you how do you sort of how do you or your products or your, you know, what you offer sort of help people in the direction of, okay, well, that might be important to you, but, you know, there's this larger uh, thing that's more of a, more of a corporate consideration. Can you, can you walk us through that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think you've you've kind of got two problems there. I think um, you know that's it's that's I experienced that issue when I was doing incident response consulting as as well, and and from a consulting aspect i you know i i think the the critical thing to beginning to overcome that is having executive buy-in ha having somebody who's above that the, those individual silos be it a, a CISO, a ceo somebody in the executive suite to sit down and say okay we're going to get everybody in a room and we're going to run through you know I, I paul you mentioned tabletops earlier mm. um being able to have everybody in a room to, to actually run through an exercise and do it together and see what those other silos are doing. Uh, I, I found that breaks down a lot of walls. I, it really does. Being able to actually open up everybody's eyes to see what's going on, what these other groups are concerned with, and maybe why that is important or why, why it isn't important. Um, but specific to the, to the SOAR technology, um, you know, I think it's really being able to codify those processes. So when, once you do have kind of a, a list of, you know, what's important, what are our priorities here, what's step one, what's step 10, being able to codify those, being able to automate them where you can, and then being able to measure them. And, you know, we talked about being able to show improvement. Okay, let's, you know, we're going to put these processes in place because we've agreed these are the 10 most important things. Being able to do that and have a, a system like a store platform that can measure your response over time and be able to see, you know, okay, we we came up with these ten processes. Maybe they're not having an impact. Maybe we need to reevaluate, and and this, a store platform can can help you gather those metrics in a in a repeatable way and in a way that that helps you evaluate your processes and procedures. John, one of the things in incident response that I always found very challenging was. When there is a security incident, it could mean that you as the security lead 
have to compel other people outside of the security group that could be legal, that could be sysadmins, that could be desktop support um, to basically stop what they're doing and become part of that incident response process. How does automation make that conversation easier and does it kind of ease the amount of work that maybe those other groups might have to do to support an incident response process? Yeah, well, you know, the, the, I think the first important aspect of that is that everything is documented in that. Or hopefully, everything is documented in your in your SOAR platform as part of your your policies and procedures. And again, having that sort of executive buy and that that person that's above each of those silos saying, "Hey, you know, this is a priority." You know, your 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 CISO, your CEO, has signed off on the incident response plan, I think is incredibly important in being able to overcome that. But the, the, a SOAR platform can help you do things like uh, notify people, make sure all the right people are notified, actually conduct those notifications. And you can actually bring some of those other stakeholders into the SOAR platform as well, allow them access to it so they can see what's going on. They can have their policies, procedures in there. They can access the information. So again, it, it kind of becomes a, a communications hub both for putting information out and, and allowing people to come in and contribute information and work inside of that central repository. Yeah, and I think that's a great way to measure it, to say, you know, as we build this process, the individual leadership can say, well, my team maybe spent this number of hours responding to an incident because it's all tracked in the automation and orchestration response platform. And then as you improve your processes and improve your security architecture, hopefully you should be seeing employees spending less time <laughs> in those different areas, right. right? And can track that. And then that's an easier sell uh, to management uh, to say, we need to maintain this process. And oh, by the way, as we improve, other groups are spending much less time helping out with this, you know, incidents that we have. And there's fewer incidents to respond to. It seems like mm -hmm. management would need to be ready also to uh, report, ha receive reports on that and have yeah. discussions about how the the metrics are trending and and um try to work on things so yeah it's, it's like not this like group it's is not spending 30 like percent right. more than every other group when they're responding to instance what can we do to help improve that it's right? not like yeah. you just implement like a soar and you know you're done it, it's like the first step of a process mm -hmm. of maturity for ir right well it needs to be part of your part of your organization it, it's not just a you know plug and done kind right. of thing it needs to become part of your of your security program and, and that's why, you know, we focus on, uh, you know, orchestration, automation, but then also measurement, because that is such a, a critical component of, of a source solution and really any security program or, a, or any security technology is being able to measure what's happening and, and use those measurements to inform the security process. Like you said, hopefully, you know, you, you implemented a source solution and you're seeing improvements and you can use those as a justification for, you know, continuing the program. Um, maybe you're not seeing improvements. And, the, and, and then the question is why? The, those are important metrics as well. Maybe five or six of your metrics are improving and, and the seventh and eighth are, are not. And, and that should be an indicator and that's useful data as well because you should be able to go back and say, okay, here's our documented policies and procedures. Why aren't we getting the expected results from this and how can we improve that? Mm -hmm. Hey, quick question. Um... You keep talking about policies and procedures, and, and again, I'm sort of having this this uh, knee-jerk reaction because uh, I work with so many companies that that struggle with understanding that they need to have policies and procedures. Um, but we, we talk very often on the show uh, about uh, you know sort of the the need for companies to have a certain level of maturity in terms of their uh, security program. Uh, and while it would seem intuitive that companies should have policies and procedures, I've seen too many companies that either don't have them or they have them because, here I'm going to say it, PCI requires them to have it, <laughs> but they don't really embrace what they actually mean or what they're supposed to do. So uh, you know, how, do you, how, how do you work with companies or how do you figure out if a company is really ready to implement a, a, a SOAR platform? Uh, how, how do you sort of gauge their maturity level or how do you get them to the point where, okay, uh, you're ready, you know, you're ready for us. You're not ready for us. You, you know, there's, there's other things you need to do first. 
Well, I think there's there's two. I, you know, I mean, you can implement a source solution probably at any maturity level, but you're going to have more success, I think, at certain points. If you have a very mature security program already, that's obviously a fantastic time for a source solution, right? You have all those policies, procedures in place. Everything's a well-oiled machine. Now we can just put it into the source solution, right? And then everything happens and there's rainbows and unicorns. But mm -hmm. I think the, a source solution can also be sort of a catalyst for starting to document some of those policies and procedures. We see a lot of times, I know, uh, you know, it's something I experience now and, and something I experienced in my uh, in my consulting role as well there may be very good practices in place but they're not documented it's just what we do you know we well you know joe does this and sally does this and and it works right but that mm -hmm. doesn't work when joe gets hit by a bus or sally goes and leaves or it's so morbid know, john getting stuff. people getting hit by a bus <laughs> i used to say that yeah. all the time and yeah. now i say that they go on vacation yeah <laughs> we, we, we prefer, we prefer yeah, exactly. what if they win yeah. the lottery right. yes right. That's make it a positive right, right. I make it a positive i used to say the bus thing all the time yeah <laughs> or you know god forbid even just litigation and and you have to go in and sit down and well you know why did you do that well because that's how we always did it um, what? so you know a source solution can be a good catalyst for actually taking those sort of, you know, institutional practices and actually codifying them and, and actually making them, you know, a, a formal process. And that's that's a kind of a good jumping off point because that's so much of what a SOAR is when you talk about, especially automation and orchestration around the, the technology components is, is documenting those workflows and, and putting them down, you know, in a, in a source solution so that they happen automatically or, or you know, some level of automation. Um, and, uh, and also even the, the manual processes, right? We talked about kind of the orchestration of, uh, of people and, and processes as a whole, something that, that is a little bit different about our solution and uh, that I think it can benefit a lot of organizations is that we don't just, uh, we don't only support full automated workflows, um, you know, with, with technology, but we also still support kind of the, the old, uh, you know, almost checklist style uh, processes that we call playbooks. And it's, it's more of a linear step-by-step -step type thing. But uh, the, the advantage to those is that they do support kind of those uh, more manual task-based processes and still allow you to orchestrate those and track those as the incident manager within a source solution so you're still working all in, in in that one place and i think having that ability also really helps um you know again kind of jumpstart organizations in getting their processes and their procedures uh into a source solution and, and documenting them in a, in a standardized manner well, i think it's a it's a logical place for it for me in that the reason you would orchestrate and automate security is to lead into incident handling and response and incident handling and response naturally leads into a forensic sometimes a forensics and in investigation and i think having that in one place is of great benefit to a lot of organizations and being able to produce a report that says we did this at this time and this at this time and and this was the output and of I think that that's why the forensics aspect is important yeah because that that timeline is extremely important for a lot of different reasons you know john mentioned it could be litigation right and i mean let's face it every incident we're responding to isn't necessarily there's a group that's targeting us specifically and trying to break into us. It could be that someone's violating an HR policy, right? I think I feel like security gets pulled into a lot of those uh, investigations that require the same skill sets as security, but aren't traditionally security. And John, I'm sure you've been in a lot of those investigations as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it is, it's something that, you know, a good source solution should really take you from that initial alert all the way through your response it, it, it shouldn't be um you know okay this is going to be good for the first 30 minutes of an investigation and then we've got to move back into our excel spreadsheet to get yeah. tracking things, or our, you know writing things down or our shared drive one note whatever you use you know if you're looking at a real an actual solution it should be something that's going to take you from that investigation phase all the way through the recovery phase and be able to manage that in a central location. But jumping some great point about that, solutions in general, security or not, if you're using email, some kind of shared drive or Excel, 
you, you probably need to look into some solution for that if you're using those things very heavily. And, and like thinking back as we start to improve our processes here at Security Weekly, those are exactly the areas where I look. I'm like, how does that process work? Oh, we have to email this person and then we you know, share a document through Google Drive and then we're, all, we're tracking it in a spreadsheet. I'm like, yeah, okay, red flag, red flag. <laughs> Even if you have an internal ticketing system, if you have an incident that involves an uh, insider uh, type of uh, yep. incident, yes. using the ticketing system can be an issue. So having a completely separate, separate. solution mm -hmm. for tracking incidents is imperative and uh, like keeping track of um, potentially sensitive artifacts or logs or things like that mm -hmm. that isn't necessarily in the same ticketing system that the customers everything use else or everything else is in, else yeah, is, in exactly. is right. you know, really important. Someone's yeah. browser history. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, having that out of band like and out of band communication as well, a way to communicate when there's an incident. You know, I think that's that yeah, that that that's hugely important too. But really honestly, I mean, you know, how many security organizations are still using uh, you know, email and and spreadsheets to to track I you know, have, having worked with a lot of, of very large uh security organizations, incident response uh groups in the past, it's 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 more than you would think that, that are still in, in, in that kind of management. Well, your solution security. has to be better than, than spreadsheets, email, and, and share documents on a drive. And, I mean, let's face it, not all solutions are there yet, right? Like the, and security aside, just in general, we internally, we have some of those processes that use the you know, email drive and, and spreadsheets. And largely it's because we haven't developed our own software to solve that problem or can't find anything that really for the price provides that much value that we're going to replace that process and your competition ends up being excel in a lot of cases and if your incident mm -hmm. involves um let's say uh, malware or something that may affect excel yep, or yep. um some sort of ransomware or something then mm -hmm. the, your your incident response process is under threat of ransomware that's mm -hmm. an issue Joff, Carlos, you guys are quiet. I'm just making sure you don't have any well, questions. Uh, we're getting, uh, you know, I got nothing. <laughs> I'll admit I got nothing. <laughs> we appreciate your honesty. I, I, I have a question. Um, in terms of, like, organization to organization, just kind of in general, what are some of the things that cannot be automated? Like, that, that you see that um, just generally do not do well with automation and require human intervention? Because it's important to understand the limitations of any technology. I mean, every technology has some limitations. Um, but where do people come in the most in a, a SOAR solution? I think it's that, that decision making and that the, some of the analytical processes, right? I, that one of the objections that we hear a lot to automation and orchestration is well you know you're looking to replace people or you you know you, you, you can't automate everything it's not going to work and that that is absolutely true you you cannot automate everything it, it, we're as even as an automation vendor we're not coming out saying hey automate all the things uh it it, it we're just not there yet um and and the purpose of automation is not to replace people it's to it's to enable people so you know uh, you still have to have those uh those humans interact at those critical junctures to make those important decisions a lot of times it's uh prior to any containment activity right so you might automate a lot of the enrichment a lot of the data gathering a lot of the correlation and then bring an analyst in to make the determination should we isolate this host uh should we ban this hash block this ip value is, is this actually even uh an incident right that may be something that that an analyst actually needs to put eyes on so uh machines are very good at, at the correlation and the uh uh, you know the the enrichment and things like that, but um, the, the the deep analytics, especially when it's um, you know uh, it's sort of a higher cost decision, right? Uh, I, I think that's where people still come into play. So, can you set up thresholds where if it's this kind of inc or it's this level of incident, or if it's this kind of incident, or um, if the confidence in the incident type? or something is low, then you can have a, a human look at it? 
Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to do that. In our solution in particular, uh, we support uh, both automated decisions and manual decisions. So you could set up a threshold that says, um, you know, if uh, the threat intelligence score comes back uh, at a 90 or above, we, okay, that's bad. We're going to go ahead and take automated action on that. Um, if it's, um, you know, 89 to, you know, 30, maybe we ought to have a manual, you know, decision being made and if it's below 30 we, we're going to consider that to be benign so you you can make those automated decisions we also allow we have a feature called a, a user choice decision that we can put into our automation and and that allows analysts to to put in uh, an automatic pause at critical junctures in the runbook so you might have one of those user choice decisions before you decide to go out to your edr solution and actually contain a host or a quarantine a host you might uh, insert one of these user choice decisions because because you always want the analyst to put eyes on that. And that allows the analyst to come in and look at all the enriched information and then make a determination as to whether that host should be quarantined. But the key is once they make that determination, you're not stopping the automation, you're just putting a pause in it. So once they make that determination, the, the run book or the playbook can continue on along whatever process that or, or path that that analyst chose. And it could prevent itself from becoming a, a um like a wall that has been hit and, and remind somebody like, hey, it's been 15 minutes and nobody's decided on this. Yeah, it just, it stops. As soon as it reaches that point in the in the, in the the workflow, as soon as it's done all the enrichment and it reaches that user choice decision or, or wherever the administrator has placed that user choice in the workflow, it stops and it notifies the security team, hey, you know, this this question is being posed as part of this incident. Yeah, but John, this, can it, can it no nag that it. person? Can it be like, you haven't <laughs> responded to this? Like this, like it's basically pulling data from multiple sources and putting it all together and going, okay, if my thresholds have told me I should notify a security person. Like does the, and it's not necessarily AI, right? But like, does the software go, hey, Paul, like you haven't looked at this in a couple of days. Can you look at that? Hey, like Paul, even, we're going to go to your manager. Right. Like yeah. HubSpot <laughs> reminds me if I haven't responded to someone in five days, it tells me whether I told it to or not. You haven't responded to this in five days, right? We're, we're working on integration with Taser so we can start. <laughs> yeah. Right, that was a fantastic that answer. The, uh, that was so great. Is, is, is that called the spousal enhancement feature? Right. Yes. <laughs> that's that's Ooh. a different feature. That's that's gonna be that's gonna be probably Q two next. Yeah. <laughs> Just spoken, in time for Valentine's Day. <laughs> spoken like exactly. a true. Oh God, product, that's a capitalist conspiracy. That true happened. product manager is like. <laughs> He was. He, he said, "Like Q2 next year, yeah, like yeah, maybe like, Q2. Yeah. Like he doesn't necessarily promise exactly in when in Q2. Just in Q2, maybe." I would have gone Q3, Q4 of next year because right. that gives you, a, you know, a long or sometime off next point. year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> we know Something your games, change. Mr. Product we Manager. Have roadmap we roadmap yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> we, we know manager. the games you play in your roadmaps. <laughs> 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 yeah, fuck about. That's awesome. <laughs> Wait, this is a family show. <laughs> it is? Wait, what? <laughs> what? Huh? Family. I'm so confused. <laughs> Whose family? More <laughs> questions for John? Sorry, we got off the rails a little bit. <laughs> we were doing so good up until that point, too. Were we? I had a <laughs> what, what are we doing? Is this a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> this is, in fact, a podcast. Sorry. Any <laughs> questions for John? <laughs> I was being serious. I was trying to be serious. It, and now an back to the segment. show. <laughs> it was an interview, but he's already done five questions, hasn't he? He has done five questions. He's done tech segments in the past. This was, yes, very much more like a discussion. Uh, probably should have labeled that as such. Uh, in the, All right. I, I, uh, yeah. I have one more question. Go ahead, Jeff. Um, uh, I heard a lot of... Uh, PCI wiffle dust in, in, in a lot of what you said. Uh, do you do you guys uh, have a particular uh, pitch that you give to customers that are trying to work with PCI, work through PCI, in terms of you know use our use our solution, you'll satisfy requirement X, Y, or Z. Um, you know, to be honest, we, we, we don't um, have a particular PCI pitch, and, and uh, maybe we're the only ones. Maybe we should we should add that. But um, no, you know, I think that's uh, blasphemy. The, 
can you not have <laughs> there's, there's obviously <laughs> aspects of of pci and any other you know name your compliance standard or your, your framework your your regulation that you can meet with a with a source solution but um you know i find a lot of a lot of organizations that are implementing uh looking at implementing a source solution really aren't looking at it just from a, a compliance aspect it, it goes above compliance um, or above any one sort of compliance or, or regulation. Um, you know, most organizations are actually looking at it because they really actually want to improve their security program, which, which is good, I think. It definitely goes above because most compliances just say you need to have an incident response plan. Tell us mm. what it is. Right. Right. Agreed. Well, John, thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly yet again. And remind everyone, you can go to dflabs.com forward slash security weekly. Find all of the interviews that we've done with DF Labs, uh, one of our sponsors, of course, um, and get a demo to uh, Inkman, uh, which is their SOAR product, very closely tied to incident response and forensics, uh, given the company background. So, John, thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly. Always a pleasure, guys. Join you again soon. With that, we're going to take a short break, come back, talk about the security news for this week. Stay tuned.